Uh, sorry, uh, your slides are not projected here. Oh, no, sorry. But someone who has access can confirm also in the room that we it's see the, the uh, presentation. Same. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, apologies again. For some reason, AD Rome didn't work as it should be. Then my mouse gave up. And uh, so it's hard to talk about the future if the present doesn't cooperate, but we will give it a try. I would like to dedicate this talk today to the memory of the late, let me see if I can work this, the late Sue Atkins, who passed away a year and a half ago. Because we are will be talking about visionaries and their visions, she is a perfect grand dame of lexicography to exactly do that. Sue Atkins was not only a great visionary in the field of lexicography, she also changed the lives of all those who came into her orbit. More than that, she made them work so hard that her futuristic insights could be transformed into actual working tools and products. This achievement should not be taken lightly. People who are ahead of their time often work in isolation or are simply not understood by their contemporaries. Here is another example from another field. This is Paul Dirac. Who would have thought that his obscure mathematics at some point, uh, which were gathering dust for decades, would be rediscovered and put to good use for detecting and recovering errors in digital computing devices. An example, think of a CD-ROM, you scratch it, and even though the data is gone, it can still be read. Second example, Ludwig von Beethoven. Listen to his Hammerklavier or, or one of his Razumovsky string quartets, knowing that this type of music utterly confused his audience 200 years ago with musicians even finding it simply unplayable. Yet listen to it today, and you find it most enjoyable. But also remember that Beethoven knew he was not bringing notes together for his contemporaries. Oh no, he claimed, they are not for you, but for a later age. So, bringing Sue Atkins, realized that her most provocative concept, that of a virtual dictionary, one that only exists at the time of access, is simply not for mere mortals, mortals to comprehend. As Sue Atkins rightly warned, if our future dictionaries do not result in a product light years away from the printed dictionary, then we are evading the responsibilities of our profession. And she spoke those words at the Eurex conference over three decades ago. And since then, and that is my view, and I will argue it today, that we have actually been sleeping at the wheel. In her orbit, Sue Atkins worked tirelessly to bring the best linguistic theories to lexicography, notably the application of frame semantics to corpus analysis with the linguist Charles Fillmore. And this resulted in a string of highly influential theoretical papers. Her collaboration with the corpus linguist Adam Kilgarev eventually resulted in the creation of the Sketch Engine, which is the de facto standard software for de developing dictionaries and for corpus linguistic research. Then you have this binary star system. Two of UK's practical lexicographers stars orbiting around some elusive Barry Center, performing an elegant tango. I'm of course talking about Sue Atkins on the one hand and Patrick Hanks on the other. Through their endless teasing and nudging of one another, they move to feel forward with their talks and their writings. So, for example, the real story of the first Cobol dictionary still needs to be written. Both Atkins and Hanks were involved, together, of course, with Sue Atkins's brother, John Sinclair. And to this date, this first Cobol dictionary, 1987, for which Patrick Hanks was the managing editor, remains one of Hanks's major contributions to lexicography. Here he is, Patrick Hanks. The, the probability measures that he proposed together with Ken Church in the paper Word Association Norms, Mutual Information and Lexicography was a starting point for Kilgare's word sketches, which is now a component of the sketch engine. Another early project, the Hector project, was the first systematic attempt ever to link word meaning to word use using corpus evidence. 
I'll come back to the Hector project later. The most relevant publications for Hector were another pas de deux between these two giants. They were published at successive complex conferences. In his magnum opus, Lexical Analysis, Norms and Exploitations, Hanks even goes as far as asking this rhetorical question. If Sue Atkins shakes the salt, is Sue Atkins to be regarded as some kind of force? But then, what if Sue Atkins shakes the world with her revelations about lexicography? And then he convincingly concludes with the realization that the semantics at work cause cognitive destabilization. The application of frame semantics to lexicography, the use of the sketch engine in corpus-driven dictionary making, and the fruitful dialogue with fellow lexicograph lexicographic giants, all of this was sped up thanks to Atkinson's association with Michael Rundell, who was also part of the first Cobalt team. Later, Atkins and Rundell teamed up to teach others those novel concepts and new tools, first in South Africa, later in Europe, and they also moved to Asia, Oceania, and even the Americas. Here you see these three giants together, Sue Atkins in the middle on her right, Patrick Hanks on the, her left, Michael Rundell. This hugely important outreach program is now known as the Lexicon Workshop in Lexicography and Lexical Computing, with the other member, Adam Kilgariff, responsible for the lexical computing part until he passed away in 2015. The written material first used in South Africa eventually morphed into this key publication, the Oxford Guide to Practical Lexicography. Now, Michael Rundell, himself an early believer in corpora, contributed significantly to the future of lexicography in solo work and in work together with his colleagues. You have a few references there. I myself have also in the past written about the future of lexicography, uh, one of them, two decades ago, Lexicographer's Dreams in the Electronic Dictionary Age. It was, it was decidedly a beat and a near exhaust, exhaustive discussion of the hot ideas in the field at the time. An example, Dream 112 dealt with electronic dictionaries in which the potential is explored to link an automatically derived dynamic user profile to the proffered multimedia lexicographic output. Seeing that such types of dictionaries were not being compiled in the years following the publication of Dreams, I grew frustrated and set out to give a fuller account of my own view of what an adaptive and an intelligent dictionary could look like using the concept of simultaneous feedback and later its digital equivalent, Fuzzy SF. At an ELEX conference, I was also interviewed for a Brazilian journal and I gave an overview of the digital uh, the field of digital lexicography and directions for its future. There, I was neither a bit nor frustrated anymore, just trying to be realistic. The problem with being realistic is that one that is that we are running after the facts, and the facts are that as lexicographers, we are becoming irrelevant. To the majority of today's youth, a dictionary means either that old book gathering dust on grandmother's shelf or anything a search engine returns for any imaginable query, whether it be textual, visual, auditory, or combinations of these. While we lexicographers were sleeping at the wheel, we were actually succeeded by the big data companies and they seem no longer to need us. And this is at least very annoying as one of the starting points of the development of all these search engines was exactly the manually compiled reference works the ones compiled by us lexicographers. So actually lexicographers were even used as guinea pigs or unknowingly to help build and test such systems. To better understand now where lexicography and meta-lexicography come from, and in the hope at the end to say something new and valuable about the future of dictionaries, it is instructive to briefly review the past half century. And I will use a little trick for that. I will use a talk, an interview that Sue Atkins gave herself. When I learned that um, 
So Atkins had passed away. My first instinct was immediately and immediately implemented was to invite the entire lexicographic community to rewatch her last talk in conversation with Michael Rundell, which is available on YouTube. In it, Michael Rundell says, Sue's impact on the profession, on the way we produce dictionaries and on the way we think about language really can't be overestimated. And indeed that video, which runs up to nearly two hours, may be characterized as an extended TED event, marrying a masterclass in lexicography, an autobiography, a review from the field from the 70s onwards. Taking in milestone papers and colleagues while also applying some small vignettes to the heavenly bodies surrounding Sue Atkins, so all those in her orbit. It is hard to imagine today that when Sue Atkins started off her career working for Collins, she was actually simply told to look at other dictionaries. Then write your dictionary articles on six by six, six by six index cards, which had to be sent back to headquarters by, by mail, physical mail. She had to use three colors of ink for different typefaces. And she was even asked to phone colleagues after 6.30 in the evening because it was cheaper at that point. The state of many competing bilingual dictionaries then was one in which translation equivalents were just listed with semicolons. Now, by the time, a few years later in 78, when she finished her English-French dictionary, she actually had, on this, in, this, in the process, developed the first style guide, come up with a practical approach to dealing with register labels, designed methods to choose good examples, and learned very hard to, to think about uh, phrasal verbs. 1980s and the 1990s, uh, despite the fact that Sue Atkins was working for commercial publishers, and uh, there was this tension with the academia, buffs in academia, uh, we still learned that from that interview, that um, in the end, she ended up being a secretary and later a president of Euralex. And she talks about all these big, big projects of the past 50 years, the Hector one, the British National Corpus, what led in the end to the sketch engines, the sketch engine, Gudex, Dante, her last dictionary project, with names such as Patrick Hanks and Rosamund Moon being thrown in left, right, and center. Now, while working on the Hector project, every time the computer crashed, in Palo Alto, the scientists were actually very happy. It later turned out that they were, but they didn't know, busy developing Alta Vista, which was one of the early web search engines. So although the struggle to create the BNC, uh, um, when she recounts the struggles of creating the BNC, we, for example, also learned that Dallas Summers came up with this very important concept of a pre competitive resource. So one that all can use before the competition starts. The simple concept has still not been grasped as may for instance be deduced from the last survey on licensing lexicographic data. Sue's brother, John Sinclair. In order to fully grasp the genesis of the revolutionary Cobalt project, project she reports a bit of very interesting uh, conversation in her interview. Sue Atkins, the real trouble about lexicography is that by the time the dictionary is in print, you've thrown away 90% of what you know about the words. So if people know that, they will never use the dictionary. To which her brother replied, well, I have a way to keep the 90%. And that, of course, was the idea to use a corpus. Bringing in the theoreticians, the linguist, Charles Fillmore. She also reports conversation with him. Fillmore, sorry, I have to admit that there are, that you are not going to persuade me that I need a corpus because I know that in my head is what I know about language and that is what I use when I'm writing. So Sue Atkins asked a little uh, question, asked for the difference between there are too many risks and there is too much risk. At which point Filmer had to say, I'm really terribly sorry, I must now withdraw my comments. And they started working together on frame semantic light. Teaching in South Africa, we learned that she revered Nelson Mandela, who said that he felt particularly strong that if you didn't have a dictionary for your native language, you perpetually felt at a loss. You're identified as a second class citizen. So she happily took up the invitation from Penny Silva to, go, to come and to go and teach in South Africa. 
She even claims, a bit tongue in cheek, that she did everything wrong. For example, she said, I'm not going to spend any time on head words because, of course, head words are easy. Of course, for the Bantu languages, we know that this is actually the main difficulty. When she gave an example for, please, all of you, write an article for the Lama sign green, um, most of the languages in the room didn't even have a word for green. So clearly, this was a two way learning exchange. Here is the first group of people that she taught. In, no, that's the second group that was in Pretoria. Um, and I happened to be there and that is where we met. Later on, the lexicon series went all over the world, as I said. So here are all the future groups that were trained on the different continents. Here an example of a lexicon in Brno, the Czech Republic. Here one in Barcelona. I was often invited to also present at those uh, workshops. Here you see in the room on the first row, Charles Fillmore, Sue Atkins and Michael Rundell. You could actually see the past 50 years with Sue Atkins at the, at the center of it all, with moons orbiting her. At which point it would, would look like something like this. Sue Atkins in the first orbit, John Sinclair, then her colleagues from her first projects, like the English French one, Alain Duval, and so forth. Then the theoreticians, Bert Levine, Igor Melchuk, Chuck Fillmore, and so forth. And we end with the younger generation, Donny Prenzler, myself, Kilgarry, and Pavel Richley. And for each of them, I will not read this, but she manages in her talk as she goes, typically for a lexicographer, she never forgets to say something that nearly is a dictionary article, a little vignette for each of them. Each person she has mentioned, she has characterized in a short way, as you can see there. Now, what have we learned from all this? Thinking out of the box. Can't you check? You are the host. No, that's exactly no. the problem. Can't you take over hosting or can't you be both hosting? Probably not because you are recording it. Go ahead. Now, so what have we learned so far? Stunningly innovative concepts and tools have been worked on over the past half century and Sue Atkins was at the center of most of it. Lexicographically speaking, however, in the European languages like English or French are actually simply too easy. There's nothing left to, to really ponder. Start with the lemma. It is, if it is not problematic to lemmatize or the words from each of the word classes, take English, you have four morphological forms for the verbs in English, three for adjectives, two for nouns, and for most other word classes, just one. Then yes, the digital dictionary will simply be a calc of the paper dictionary when it comes to the macrostructure and the question of how to approach the lamata. But consider a language in which one simply does not even know where to begin the lamatization. Every attempt to produce a paper dictionary will look different. So this, in a digital environment, can easily be solved by not forcing any type of lemmatization. Users of such a dictionary simply search for orthographic words as they are pronounced or written, or as they are heard or read. So a recent study published in IGL on Hoopa, which is a Native American language from Northwestern California, is a good case in point. It's a polysynthetic language, and actually the solution to solve the the macrostructural issues for that language is to use the computer to decompose and recompose so that users simply input full orthographic forms as they are heard or found in written form. That would also mean that the dictionary actually has no lemmata and no real macrostructure, but that would really be thinking out of the box. I'm now going to show you 50 oppositions. After looking, having looked in the macrostructure, and theoretically you have to go to the microstructure, the media structure, the mega structure, and so on, but this approach for the digital world is ineffective. Five, 50 oppositions in five subsections. 
Firstly, about the dictionary making process. These are claims. All future dictionaries will be born digital. While this may be uncontroversial, many will still be compiled via crowdsourcing and be stored in the clouds. We will be using bottom-up processes, and in the end, your dictionaries will be far more democratic. All future dictionaries will come from semi-automatic corpus extraction. Um, they will be analyzed from scratch, no more alphabetical uh, copying in, a, in alphabetical order. Future dictionaries and the, will see the defining and the translation in an automated way. Examples will, of course, not be invented anymore. They will all literally come from corpora of naturally produced speech or text. So the entire compilation process will be performed by machines. And software to do so had already been suggested by Kilgariff in 2010, follow-up article in 2019 recently by the team that took over. And for those who were at my talk on Monday, we now have ChatGPT to massively help you with all of these levels. We will soon have machines basically taking over the entire writing process without the need uh, of human involvement. Dictionary compilation will also be faster than ever. It can be live, as was also demonstrated on Monday. You can be compiling your dictionary, or rather, chat GPT can be writing dictionary articles, and with a click, the material is immediately online for everyone to use. Future lexicographers will be computer scientists. Summarizing all what I said, you have on the one hand the past and the current and the present, versus the future. So you go from publisher and academia-driven lexicography to crowdsourced, from top-down to bottom-up, from undemocratic to democratic, from manual reading to automatic corpus extraction, from copying in alphabetical order to analysis and synthesis from scratch, from written out by hand to automatic defining and translation, from invented examples to corpus examples, from dictionary compilation by humans to the same by machines, from slow to fast production, from language graduates to computational linguists and computer scientists. Second group, supporting tools and their concepts. Everything is professionalizing. We have corpus query packages, we have dictionary writing systems, and of course the distinction will disappear and they will become one tool. We will need theories, linguistic theories to inform what we do. Whether we like it or not, we are all of us using one or several. It could be one of those listed there, the one of Melchuk, Fillmore, Lake of Ustayovsky, or Hanks. These days, we tend to try to see glossaries, vocabularies, terminologies in separate categories, or dictionaries and thesauri and encyclopedia and so on. Of course, these are distinctions that will blur. Only meaning potentials, eh? words that don't have meanings, only, sorry too fast. Um, it is well known that the words don't have meanings. They only have meaning potentials that are triggered by their contexts. So future dictionaries will always map meaning on to use a concept from Patrick Hanks. For specifically for bilingual lexicography, uh, as Sue Atkins has shown, it is a bit absurd to try to cram eight dictionaries in one. Uh, you try to satisfy native speakers and learners, encoding, decoding, and the two directions. So two times two times two is eight, with the effect that the target language always exerts a pull on the source language. Future dictionaries can easily avoid that. And Sue Atkins gave a prototype dictionary in 96 as an example of how it can be avoided supporting tools and concepts still. And, um, I further claim that the real innovations will not come from English or EFL lexicography, but will be found in dictionaries for languages of limited diffusion, inclusive dictionaries, say sign language dictionaries, and dictionaries for endangered or revitalized languages, such as those from Australia. Summarizing all of this, we go from shoe boxes and filing cabinets to corpus query packages, from word processes to dictionary writing systems, from no theory to linguistic theories, from fixed dictionary types to the blurring of all types, from focus on meaning to focus on use. Then that pool of the target language 
will disappear. Dictionaries for major languages set the trend today. In the future, it will be the other ones. Block number three, the appearance of the dictionary. To this day, if one conjures up the image of a dictionary, a physical product comes to mind. So the future one, of course, will be intangible. Whether it is, no matter where it is, you will not be able to touch it. They will also be dynamic. They will have levels of granularity, layers of varying complexity. And one will be able to switch on and switch off different dictionary slots. They will be search centric. And they will be organic in that they change over time. Going from past to future, one also moves from a finished product actually to an interactive service. Hmm? Lexicographers will really be conversing with their users. And again, I'm thinking of my talk of uh, Monday where ChatGPT actually is a dialogue box and can actually talk to you and you talk to the machine to get your lexicographic data. So the greatest problem with the dictionary of the past is that its published appearance must fit all the users at all times. So it's a one size fits all. And the greatest breakthrough will be one where you have a personal dictionary, unique for each user, adapting to the task at hand, changing over time. And that, of course, links to Sue Atkinson's ID concept of the virtual dictionary. Before her concept, we had dot with similar project, uh, IDs, and I myself have also a similar ID, which was published in Dreams. Multimedia will really explode. It will be truly multimedia. And the output will be truly multilingual and even anilingual in future. Consultation, we talked about the lemma sign. Huh? That is difficult in some languages, unlike for English. And the consultation will be via any inflected form with automatic rerouting. And that division between A to Z list and onomasiological dictionaries will also dis disappear. If you're interested in that, come to the talk next Monday, where I will present a solution. Uh, and we call it an alpha conceptual dictionary. So there will also be multiple routes into the data to reach the microstructure directly. Study of log files attached to dictionaries has revealed that dictionary users no longer consult single words. Right? They really search, seek any treatment of uh, text. Uh, an increased focus on frequent clusters and collocates already predicted by Grafenstadt. We search dictionaries, we have stopped looking up. And we have in the future dictionaries that will provide exact answers to imprecise, fuzzy, and even incomplete queries. Future dictionaries will basically, yeah, we will as users speak to the machines by simply asking and hearing, by looking and seeing the answer, or by pointing any device to the material we want lexical or even encyclopedic information about. Here is an example, we're in Japan, one of the greatest inventions for the rest of the world. Uh, you don't want to uh, risk uh, anything wrong while in uh, that uh, cabinet. So all you have to do is uh, point your device towards the Japanese uh, characters. And in this case, my children did it and they get all the translations just like this in context uh, into their language, which is Dutch. So they know what not to burn and uh, their future family will be ensured. So, Current lexicographical products have a clear bias, where, whereas those of the future will include seamlessly attached multimedia, corpora, cross-references, or better, hyperlinks. Um, users unsatisfied, unsatisfied with the synthesis prepared by the, by the machines will not be in a position to study the raw data uh, or the summaries prepared by dedicated tools, such as word sketches. Again, uh, uh, artificial intelligent tools like ChatGPT uh, can help you massively at 
uh, on that level. So all in all, future dictionaries will cease to be a product and become a true service. As with any other service, users will decide how much they make use of it. They may very well not even realize that dictionaries are involved. So the dictionary between quotation marks may well, may still be pinpointed uh, as long as these dictionaries are standalone tools as the great majority are today, but when they come bundled with other language tools, they will kind of disappear. And of course, if they are used as back ends to say uh, machine translation, spell checking and so forth, uh, very few users still realize that there are dictionaries. So they are subsumed in other tools, such as augmented writing assistance, beautiful example being, being collocate, which gives real-time collocation suggestions. Picturing the dictionary of the future will thus become nigh impossible. Summarizing all of this, look, we go from paper to dictionary, from static to dynamic, from a finished product to an interactive service, from a one size fits all to personal, customized, from one, two or three media to just really truly multimedia, from mono, bi and trilingual to multi and anilingual, dictionary access from Lamata to any inflected form, hit and miss currently to automatic rerouting from divisions between SEMA and onomasiological to no need to make a distinction anymore, access via single routes to multiple access routes, hardware treatment versus any length of text, exact lookup versus search, fuzzy search, manually thumb a book versus ask and hear, look and see, point and hear, a lexical bias, which becomes Lexis and data in general, Bound cross references become unbound. Synthesis dictionaries will become do it yourself. Product versus service, standalone versus subsumed by other tools. What do we know about already? Eh? What are the facts about the dictionary of the future? When the future dictionary users use their dictionaries, they will know a few facts about their language too. Firstly, they will know it is always up to date. This will be because the case not only because users will expect it, but especially because it will be a design feature. If they are not up to date, the dictionaries will simply not sell. Monitor corpora will be used to achieve this up to dateness. Secondly, future dictionaries users will know that the searches they perform will always result in context sensitive answers, because if they are not, the dictionaries will be useless. One of the things that will have to be really solved on a high level is word sense disambiguation, because without it, dictionaries of the future will simply frustrate users. Here is a good example of a current digital dictionary. I search for first papers in the online Merriam-Webster earlier today. Now, the definition that you get, and I will go to it, is correct. It's the first papers are the papers declaring the intention filed by an applicant for citizenship as the first step in the naturalization process in America. Then, because it's a fancy modern dictionary, they scroll the internet for examples, but all the examples you give, these are the first four, and these are the next four. You can read any of them. Take the last one. Back in 2001, Enfield published one of the first papers that analyzed blah, blah, blah. None of the examples exemplifies the definition. Now, ironically, they have a note there saying, sorry, we are not responsible for uh, the content of those examples. Uh, of course, they add this. This is America. They don't want to be sued, but actually we should sue them because they are misleading us. But then 10 examples and none of them exemplifies the sense. Sorry, I said 10, it's eight examples, eight. Thirdly, future dictionary users will know that their accessing the dictionary will always be helpful. Even if there is no perfect answer, the tool will still present the user with interesting information. Think of you want to buy a book on Amazon, you can't find it, you get another one that is nearly as interesting. So dictionary makers should achieve the same level of usefulness towards the users. Fourthly, 
Future dictionary users will know that they are interacting with machines. And that is dangerous because users will become unforgiving. Machines don't make mistakes. They are always right. Five. The past was about historical dictionaries, especially and learners' dictionaries. The future will especially be at their best when they deal with neologisms. Because if they are not, they are literally, there are no recent events in the dictionary. And so there is no news in the dictionary. So when someone, we won't name that person, starts suddenly using Covife in a tweet, you simply have to know. It, the dictionary must have covered that by then. A good example from the past, in the 50s, we had the word Sputnik appearing in the Thorndike Barnhart dictionaries in record time. But future neologists will truly be able to enter dictionaries simultaneously with entering the language. And this fact has not escaped lexicographers. Neologisms featured at every conference in 2021 at the DSNA. Unprecedented measures were reported at Merriam-Webster to include coronavirus words. You have a few there. We all know them by now. Then even in the update, they continued working on coronavirus-related words. Some of them were clearly one-day flies, and they are not known or not used anymore. At AsiaLex, we were presented with a full-blown, no, even two full-blown and published dictionaries, English-Chinese and Chinese-English, solely on COVID-19 terms. At Afrolex that same year, we had one for Chichewa. At Elex, we saw that the top salient words for 2020 were all corona-related. At Australex, Neuralex, and Globalex, we had a workshop series on neologisms, all devoted and one of them, sorry, devoted entirely to COVID-19. Summarizing this, from always out of date to always up to date, context-free info to context-sensitive answers, sometimes helpful to always helpful from humans, sometimes machines, to machines, for machines, sometimes humans, focus on historical dictionaries, later learners' dictionaries to a focus on neologists. The last little block, the image of the dictionary. What can we contrast there? Well, much to the chagrin of today's lexicographic community, the authority with which the fruits of our labor used to be regarded is being eroded. The dictionary of the future will be self-effacing. Ironically, this change is going hand in hand with the defensible move from prescriptiveness to descriptiveness in lexicography. By presenting, Rather than imposing language facts, however, we kind of hand over control, the control that we used to have. In future, that handover will have been completed. While the coverage in our dictionaries has out of necessity always been limited, at least it was curated. In the future, with open-ended coverage, the result can only be a rag back. Given the past prestige of our reference works, people have always been willing to pay for them. But in future, a good dictionary will be a free dictionary. One you have to pay for will not be a good dictionary. Until recently, people were aware of the fact that it was essential to consult dictionaries and that they were, and that they could actually truly benefit from doing so. But in future, people will stop realizing that they actually need dictionaries. In the past, Dictionary users appreciate that a lot of work went into compiling reference works. In the future, dictionaries will be seen as containers of mere facts. And because one cannot own facts, dictionary contents will be seen as a public good. So it can be freely copied. It can be freely used, reused, without acknowledgement, as ChatGPT is already doing. We are also witnessing the rapid consolidation of the last few remaining reference publishers. So we are reaching a monopoly, which is certainly not a good prospect. Whereas travel to exotic places used to be truly challenging, including linguistically and for us lexicographers, um, 
as a result of this homogenization, this too will disappear. Here are two little examples. An Ethiopian who wishes to order a dish in China where the, men, the menu is in Mandarin only, no problem. Point your smartphone to the Chinese characters and hear them pronounce in Amharic. Then speak and order in Amharic and have your smartphone do the same for you. Do the talking, I mean, in Mandarin. I could give another example. We just had a visit from the police here in Tokyo. The man, the policeman did not speak a word of English. He spoke into his smartphone. We listened to the English. My wife replied in English and he heard it in Japanese. Of course, lexicographic tools are involved in all this, but they have disappeared. So I gave another variant here, a Japanese who wants to make sense of an email sent in Greek. Well, simply dump the contents in Google Translate, compose the answer in Japanese, do the reverse, and the answer arrives in Athens in perfect Greek. So another thing that will dip, disappear is all the lexicographies that we have created linguistic, typographical, non-typographical ways to condense material. It makes it look scholarly. It makes it look, look dictionaries look complex. Now, none of this will be needed in future. And because it will disappear, the visualization of scholarship will also disappear. Everything will look easy. Anyone can do it. So all this boils down to the fact that the symbolic value which printed dictionaries had in the past, their Bible status, so to say, will vanish into thin air in the future. These can be summarized in the following table. We go from proudly prescript, prescriptive to merely descriptive. Limited curated coverage to open-ended ragback of coverage. Dictionaries were expensive, but worth the cost. Future, only free dictionaries are good dictionaries. Users know it is essential to consult dictionaries. Users do not even realize they will need dictionaries. Dictionaries are the result of hard and serious labor. Dictionaries remain and contain mere facts, so can be freely copied. Competing and different deferring reference publishers will become consolidated one-stop service need to be able to read and understand an exotic script, no more. No need to be able to read nor understand any exotic script anymore. Abbreviations, codes, symbols, telegraphies will become plain language. And lastly, the symbolic value, this Bible status will disappear. And in the future, dictionaries will have no status. Okay. What does the future do? We have to join forces with the big data companies. One other early great thinker is Gregory Grafenstadt, who in a keynote at Eurolex in 98 asked, will there be lexicographers in the year 3000? Now, in as much as lexicographers are the people who compile dictionaries, the 50 oppositions we just saw uh, should lead to a clear answer. The question can actually be rephrased as, Will there be dictionaries in the year 3000? And sadly, the answer is obvious. Apart from legacy dictionaries, no doubt of, no doubt all of them digital or retro digitized, no new dictionaries as we know them today will be found a thousand years, not even a hundred years from now. Unless, unless, of course, both the concept of a dictionary and the job of a lexicographer is redefined. You can compare it with the word chauffeur. Chauffeur, I pronounce it in uh, Dutch. This may be compared, huh? uh, what, what is the word chauffeur? It's the person driving wealthy people around. Well, initially a big part of the job of a chauffeur was actually both to stoke a steam engine and to keep it running. With the word chauffeur derived from the French chauffeur to heat. Now, today's electric cars only use power from the grid, so no heat whatsoever is produced in the car, but the word chauffeur stuck and of course is still used. A decade ago at an ELEX 2011 conference, Michael Randall, Aaron McCain, you see her there from TED fame, and Adam Kilgariff and a number of others got ahead of themselves and wondered 
So it was 2011. Will there be still, uh, will there still be dictionaries in 2020? Well, the year 2020 came and went, and we know there are still some dictionaries and there are still some lexicographers, some of whom are sitting in this room and are listening right now. That raises the question, considering these oppositions that I presented, is there anything that is common across them? If so, can those commonalities be joined together and be brought back to the current concept of a dictionary? 20 years ago, I suggested to define dictionaries as follows, di digital dictionaries, collections of structured electronic data that can be accessed with multiple tools, enhanced with a wide range of functionalities and used in various environments. Now the icon, the great icon of early American dictionary making, Lawrence Ordan, uh, sincerely hoped that that was not my definition of a digital dictionary. Perhaps because an important feature is missing. There is no focus in my definition on the lexical. Indeed, that was by design. I've always disliked Bloomfield's view of lexicography and lexicographers as pop. The lexicon is really just an appendix to the grammar. It's basically a list of irregularities. So, but point taken, Erdang was right. What is common and what defines dictionaries and lexicographers is that they focus on lexical analysis, on meaning. And they do so by studying and cataloging actual uses of words, collocates, phrases, and much larger chunks of text. These days, in unimaginably large quantities, as found in corpora, and thus with the help of computers, and of course, number crunch the data to present them to humans with summaries. Corpora can be raw, but they are better when they are lemmatized, part of speech text, and annotated in other ways. So, in addition to not explicitly mentioning the lexical nor even lexical analysis in my definition, my earlier characterization of digital, digital dictionaries did not even refer to language, whether it was oral or written, and that too was by design. With my generic electronic data, I wish to refer to the bits and bytes, the zeros and the ones of any type of communication, even the nonverbal type in any type of medium. Surely in future dictionaries, one will be able to access the data via signing, via smell or touch, possibly only images, audio or video in return. In such dictionaries, there is no lexus left. There is no language left. Yet, information and those meaning is still conveyed and the actions still have to be decoded and defined. And that is now in both in red and in bold, the task of a lexicographer, even a future one, that, uh, that will be the task of the lexicographer, even a future one. That is the task of a dictionary, even a future one. This focus on meaning that needs to be decoded and defined. So if you do what is written there, and I won't show it, given we are in Japan, you will search a dictionary, for example, by merely raising your middle finger towards it. To hear that your sign is uh, used to express displeasure, but also that it is rude to signal like that. Or to have, uh, think of chat GPT, uh, your, your sign immediately transformed into a Unicode character that you can immediately use in your code that you're busy writing. Or another example, place your dictionary next to the dish you're about to eat in a restaurant in Mumbai and have that dictionary pick up the aromas to inform you about the spices and the herbs it contains or to present you with the pictures of the plants from which the spices and herbs are sourced. Or yet another example, tap away a little Russian folk tune on your dictionary and hear and see how Beethoven recomposed it. And I'm coming back to the opening slide and to his Razumovsky string quartets. That is the future of our dictionaries. Future dictionaries that will have more in common with today's search engines, e-commerce platforms, mobile apps, social networks, personal computers, and microblogging sites than with current dictionaries. But will future lexicographers also have more in common with today's data scientists 
who already work at the companies developing such tools than with current lexicographers. Well, if we are not attentive, and if we continue to sleep at the wheel, our profession will indeed be gobbled up by them. So what can we offer them? Well, the answer is our craft, as in the famous title of Sidney Lando's book, The Art and Craft of Lexicography. We are still better than machines and will likely always remain better in taking computer generated summaries on how language works and on how language is used to derive meaning from that. See the discussion between Hanks and Rondal in 2002 at a Eurolex conference. Lexicographers will always better understand lexis, language use, and all types of meaning, and be better equipped to interpret and synthesize it than people in any other profession. And certainly better than machines I had written before coming to Japan, no matter the sophistication of the machine learning or the artificial intelligence involved. But see what I talked about on Monday, Chat GPT is currently so advanced that we are reaching a point where machines come close to be able to do what humans are able to do. With characteristic insights, so Atkins once pointed out, lexicographers have to be born before they are made. And that led the person you see there, Edward Finnegan, to observe. Her statement haunted me a bit as discussion of lexicographical automation may suggest that lexicographers don't even need to be made, don't even need to exist, so long as the artificial intelligent folks can finesse their algorithmic magic. Now, I hope you have shown today that the big data technicians will never be able to supplant us as long but that is important, as long as we continue to convince their employers that they need our skill set, our know-how, our scientific research. We're going to wrap everything up in a small epilogue. A fact-backed extrapolation of the future. Rather than jump into the future of dictionaries to describe that future in medias res, I have opted in the past 40 minutes, 45 minutes, to not to hypothesize about the future of dictionaries at all, but to base all my claims on facts that can be observed today and to extrapolate from those facts. What this approach demonstrated about dictionary making is how a real person, Sue Atkins, who was alive when some of us were for some time, all changed the course of lexicography towards the future. So lexicographers, make the future. By opening and closing with Sue Atkins, we not only fleshed out a, a recent super lexicographer, we also articulated her network. Her epithets for her colleagues show linguists, how linguists, lexicographers, and computer scientists work together in developing new approaches to lexicographers' work with the aim of producing radically different types of reference works. Now, ironically, the core element of Sue Atkinson's vision of the virtual dictionary uttered a quarter century ago, namely that the information provided will exist only at the time of consultation is now everywhere. Example, think a map to navigate around the city and see how it forms around you on the screen in the palm of your hand with you at the center of it all at all times, even as you move through space and time, and indeed, as it changes with time. So it is ubiquitous, yet it passed lexicography by. We didn't do it. The big data companies did it. Here they are, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, Twitter. Alphabet, what's in a name? Did it for general and factual information. Amazon for shopping, Apple for mobile assistance, Meta for social networking, Microsoft for personal computing, Twitter for microblogging. Truly, data for all of them is the new oil. But lexicography is not yet there. The L, lexicography, capital L. Rather than have the big data companies attempt to do our work, we should convince them that they will be better off joining forces with lexicography. 
lexicographers have something unique to offer. To offer, it is in our DNA. Only we know how to get to the bottom of how language works. Only we have the craft to derive meaning from usage, and only we are able to synthesize this beautifully for both human and machine consumption in any number of ways. So in future, our lexical analysis will not be wrapped in dictionaries. They will disappear, disappear from view to become data among ever more data in a linked data network. But if done right, they could become the crown data for which the big data companies will be willing to pay good money. As with our crown data, their tools and their products will be better and sell better than they do today. Lexicographers, therefore, should continue doing what they do. Trust the data. Reference to John Sinclair. Lots of it. Have machines do the heavy lifting and pre-processing and then come in for the invaluable final finishing. Given that we have now given up on the idea that uh, we need to work face to face, since Corona, we know that a virtual uh, world is possible, all work will become virtual in future, ever more international, with complementary skills about ever more languages, and the data will be stored in the cloud and licensed from the clouds. All so that lexicographers will be able to serve users and machines with their ever-growing lexical needs. Whether they know it or not, they have ever-growing lexical needs. And now for the last two slides. Steve Jobs, the co-pioneer of the personal computer revolution and the co-creator of so many iTools, once said, a lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. So you lexicographers of the future, just show what we need. That should also be the guiding principle of future lexicographers and meta lexicographers. Stop asking dictionary users what they want. Just make the best possible dictionary tools and study how they are used. Then share your research results online in continuously growing repositories, approached and searched with the help of increasingly smarter access and summarizing software. As I showed in a talk on meta lexicography yesterday for the Iwasaka Linguistic Circle. There is then a clear path towards future dictionaries and lexicographers. And if we seize the moment, both may thrive going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Deschreiber, for your excellent and insightful talk, covering a really a lot of ground, theories, and people in such a short time, and uh, pointing to the exciting and uh, scary future for lexicographers, but uh, uh, it seems to be around the corner and uh, and slideshow. Okay. And uh, perhaps I'm... reassuring to some extent to us lexicographers. Okay, thank you very much. Now we'd like to open the floor for discussion. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please demute yourself and shout, or uh, will you put your questions in the chat box? Who sees the chat box? <laughs> Not me. Back to the original state. But perhaps we can start with the room then. Who has experience with this? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Do you see uh, questions? No, no, not yet. Can I ask you? 
Yeah. The first question? Yes, of course. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> okay, to, to, to give others some time to think about the question. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent lecture again. I One of the things I wondered is uh, user friendliness in the in the future dexco lexicography, dictionary making, dictionaries. Uh, where there's no lexicographers, but the uh, job of lexicographer is taken over by uh, computer scientists. Uh, there's no physical book, but um, intangible just data set uh, stored in a crowd. Uh, not static, but dynamic. Where does user friendliness go? and come in the future dictionaries. Thank you for this tricky question. Uh, it's not tricky, but uh, there's no concept of it. Uh, so. No, of course, uh, but uh, what is user-friendly is what is easy to use. So the easier, the, the more plain language that will be used to achieve a search, the better the product will be. The fewer clicks, the fewer struggle to get at the answer, the better. That is why on Monday, we claimed that the future will be something like the dialogue that we saw with ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. Instead of searching in this incredibly complex way, you ask a search engine for a number of websites and you go and you read up and you try to find the answer yourself, you will have machines who basically just formulate the answer and give you straight to the point the answer that is user friendly. The current situation is actually, of course, given our age, we think it's fantastic where we came from before computers to wet computers to search engines to being able to know everything about anything, but it is still cumbersome. Look at the artificial intelligence components that now made available, and it's just the beginning, more are coming. They basically talk to you and give you what I mentioned context sensitive answers to your very specific query. So that is user friendliness. So uh, it should not be um, uh, consciously, user friendliness does not need to be consciously made, built into, into it. It's user friendliness is taken for granted. Unfortunately, yes. And those of us who have been around for, for long enough uh, find it very frustrating that the current generation doesn't realize anymore the complexities of everything that is inside. They take a spell checker for, for a given. It is there. Of course it is there. If you ask uh, the current generation, uh, where do you get your lexical info from? You don't put it like this, but uh, uh, where, where, how do you use a dictionary? What is a dictionary for you? They will just say, well, I Googled it, right? They don't realize anymore that in the end, there was someone, a team probably of people analyzing the data, summarizing it, synthesizing it, writing it, what we know as a dictionary article. And they don't care because for them, what they now have is user friendly. Tuck, tuck, tuck. There is the answer for all common words. Even a search engine like Google even just puts it for you there at the top as if it's a dictionary article. Yeah, for more uh, uncommon words, uh, it will just be links and you have to start uh, basically assembling the info yourself. Yeah, but the step to user friendliness will be there it is. And you talk in the future to your machine. So you will say, well, I don't want it in the format. Summarize it in bullet form. Write it in code. Use prose. I like poetry. Put it in a poetry form. Stanzas, quatrains, whatever. So it will really become this unique tool for each. Eh? Each person will have its, their own unique, adapted, intelligent dictionary. And we talked about it for a long time. Myself, I talked about it for 20 years. I never thought I would see it in my lifetime, but here it is. If 
today we can do what we saw and we see now, we can imagine five, 10 years from now, it will be just mind blowing and dangerous of course as well, because who will be the author and what about copyright issues and uh, what about correctness because these machines also hallucinate. So uh, make up the facts. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one comment, I'm a PhD student in Turin. Thank you so much. Really interesting. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, I'm Kaoru. Hi, Zoom Morris. Uh, first of all, I would like to make uh, make sure that uh, I'm right in my understanding. The, uh, the future, you don't need to make a distinction between dictionaries for learners and dictionaries for native speakers in the future. Um, no, you could, of course, but um, if all the data will be in one big database, the database will serve both the natives and learners and children and uh, elderly people, both for their lexical and encyclopedic needs. Um, th this this uh, fictional, not fictional, artificial uh, division that we now use, that, uh, of course, it's also a bit of marketing. Huh? Uh, a publisher prefers to have 100 items on the shelf than just one. But it's kind of arti artificial to, to try to divide all the needs of the people into all these, uh, well, products as today. So in future, there's just, if you want a black box, some of us will understand the black box, but most users won't. They won't even think about the fact that, oh, this time I'm actually querying my native knowledge. And then another time I'm querying unknown knowledge because I'm the learner there. So they will just ask, to chat about information. And it doesn't matter anymore uh, whether they know that they're actually being a learner at that point or a mother tongue speaker who needs, who needs in-depth knowledge of, of a lexical item of their own language. And so it will be, um, uh, well, it is already the case. Uh, chat GPT, for example, uses what uh, 1,000 uh, billion words as a one big database. They don't try to subdivide this into uh, little domains uh, for different levels of users and so on. No, it's just all there. So these these categories, if you want, will disappear and will become irrelevant. Yes. Uh -huh. Already, uh, well, already well, a search well, engine does that. A search engine does not ask you, who are you? How old are you? Well, they try to use cookies and get to know you, but that's just for advertisement purposes. They don't really serve you what you really need. They just <laughs> serve you ad advertisements. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Akasu. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Professor Tono. Um, well, it's really overwhelming the all the information. Uh, and but uh, one thing uh, which struck me was the uh, comments made by Sue Atkins when she uh, helped. Uh, John Sinclair for building, uh, mean uh, compiling uh, COVID one. Uh, she said that uh, you know, like school affairs threw threw away ninety percent of the information, and uh, if if they hadn't done that, you know, probably nobody used the dictionary. You said something like that, right? So uh, that means we we have some kind of a uh, you know needs to select the information you know even though we know 100 percent for the target purpose for users we need to select certain information to deliver you know uh, do you have any um opinions about you know uh, as, as you see all this uh, changing lexicographic uh, uh uh sort of uh, information and also uh, uh, future future lexicography do you have any comments about uh, 
how we could set criteria for selecting information for dictionaries. You know, uh, for us, uh, we have a, a, a less advanced English learners in Japan. You know, uh, for advanced learners, probably you know uh, anything can, can go, and uh, you know we can just collect all the information and provide them, and maybe users can make a decision about uh, you know which one to choose. But uh, in the case of uh, less advanced learners. Maybe we need to sort of tailor some of the information uh, in such a way that the learners can pick and understand. You know, uh, so so th there must be some kind of a criteria uh, for choosing information for target users. But how how would you do that uh, in such a sort of anything go like uh, environment? And do you have any comments on that? Yes, definitely. Um, actually, two days ago on. Uh... We are Saturday now. On Thursday, it was, yes. On Thursday, I gave a talk on exactly that, an example for a Swahili dictionary where um, you, um, you, you target certain users. It's also valid for the dictionaries I did for Oxford University Press, Zulu, Kosa, Sutu. Um, you typically get a page limit. And you must fit in, say, 5,000 words per site. So, And each article has a certain length, no more. How do you do that? How do you make sure? that you have covered, in this case, it was 70% of what is seen. So Sue Atkins said, if I study all the data, in the end, I have to throw away 90%, I only keep 10% from my dictionaries. And we don't tell the people, because if they knew, they would never use a dictionary, because, well, it only contains 10%. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was English and French, big languages, lots of data at the time. So my... Um, experiences with smaller languages, uh, well, not smaller languages, but with less data, all languages are equal. So take my, my Zulu dictionary. In the end, I calculated that well, the answer, I forgot, otherwise I go in all directions. The answer is frequency. That is the two, corpus frequency. So if you have a certain number of pages, you calculate in advance the average length of your articles. That means a certain number of senses or meaning potentials, according to Patrick Hanks. Patrick Hanks. Mm -hmm. A certain number of meaning potentials per article. That means that each time you see corpus lines, you know, on average, you have, say, three meaning potentials. You go for the top frequent ones. And indeed, you throw away, in my case, for Zulu, it was, I knew, I knowingly kept 70%. And through weight 30 percent what does that number mean um expressed in tokens with everything that is in the dictionary with the senses that are there the lamata with the senses i cover 70 percent of the tokens in any average zulu text so i know my zulu covers 70 percent not 100 no dictionary covers 100 because it's a tale it's never ending but the there has been a debate, and I put everyone on the wrong foot, and that's what I presented uh, two days ago in my analysis of a Swahili dictionary. I, in a paper in 2006, claimed that there is no correlation between, on the one hand, corpus frequency, and on the other hand, the frequency with which users look up. Because you see, if we believe in corpus-driven lexicography, there must be a correlation. We only put what is frequent in the dictionary because we assume that, well, those things will be looked up frequently. If there is no correlation, well, we can all go home and stop doing corpus-based and corpus-driven, especially studies. So in a 2006 publication, I proved there is no correlation. I was wrong, luckily. I revisited the data in 2019 with a team in Germany using a much better methodology. And we now are convinced that there is a beautiful correlation. So the answer to your question, and I have given a bit more bulk to that, is corpus frequencies. This is the way to have cutoffs and you can really use them blindly. I have so many words or so many lamata, whether it's paper or digital, and I'll work up to that threshold. 
and not beyond. And within each word, also again, uh, you, you describe a certain percentage of all the meaning potentials and no more. And that is hard. Sue Atkins was right. That is very hard to say, I am now a world specialist on this concept or this term or word, but I cannot share my knowledge. I have to stop writing here. Corpus frequencies. Hence big data, hence what we, we, we now witness uh, with the chat boxes. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Any anything uh, from you, Jamois, to add? Final, oh, final remarks. The final, the final remarks. Yes. Okay. To wrap up. So I must admit that this paper was written before, before there was this release of these uh, modern artificial intelligent uh, chat boxes. Um. I did not revise the text, as you have seen throughout the slides. I put in brackets references to the, the future future, if you want. So what I said, in a way, could be seen as dated already, although it has not been published. This is the first time I talk about it. That said, when going through it, I realized that, well, it is still predicting the future, I feel. Because even though programmers and people who are really into the fields, uh, someone like David Joffe, who programs a dictionary writing system, TLEX, and me, who really is into the field day in, day out, we know about the future. It will still take some time before the entire community, the thousands of us meta lexicographers and lexicographers, will be convinced to jump in. So, we can already look ahead beyond the future that I predicted today, which is tools like BART from Google, tools like ChatGPT from Microsoft. Uh, I don't know what how the one from Beidou will be called, but China is of course working on similar tools. So there will certainly be an explosion of such tools, but it will take some time, especially in the humanities, especially in the humanities to pick up so in medicine, they're already convinced these tools can help them calculate things and discover aspects of their research that they wouldn't have been able otherwise. Fields like economics, well, the chat tools have already been actually used to try to pass exams and some exams they pass which is incredibly stunning. I mean, these chat boxes were not in class, did not read the manuals, and they pass an exam at university. But this is especially in, in, in facts, yeah, the, the, the hard sciences, hmm? mathematics, economics. We tend to think of our fields, languages, oh no, this is a very personal, emotional affair. We, we have to be human to do that until you ask such a machine to produce poetry and you're stunned by how good it is. They can do it. So, but given we are in this field of, we have to be able to read and write properly, correct spelling, good grammar, it is very hard for us to admit that the machine can do it better than your average student. Actually, we now know at my university already, and there has been a, an email going around, if your student's work does not contain spelling errors anymore, and if it's grammatically correct, it has been written by a chat box. Mm -hmm. So from today onwards, you will want to see errors. You will want a structure that is not logical because the chat box does better, does not make mistakes on that level. So we have to reinvent ourselves going forward. We have to admit that these tools are there. Work with them. 
work with them and just teach in a different way, assess in a different way and reverse it. Here is something that the machine did. Chat GPT wrote something for you. Criticize it, you reverse it. Don't ask people to write an assignment at home because the machine will be talking. Let them handwrite things. So we go back in certain, for certain aspects. Let them sit in class, use a pen, blank sheet, write, or involve the machine. The machine has done this. Be critical about it. Try to improve on it. But it needs a mind shift that, especially the humanities, will find very hard to make. So apply to lexicography. It will take some time. So that's, uh, if you want to comment, uh, comment on my own paper of today, I think the future that I presented is still the future, but there is already a beyond future as well, waiting for us, for those who are ready. Okay, thank you very much again for sharing your expertise and insights. I'm afraid it's about well, it's over time, and uh, this concludes Professor Describer's lecture. Thank you very much. Please give him a big hand again. <laughs>